So hi everyone, it's Nina Collins from The Wolfer, and we're here today to talk about a really special book, um, a book called Heartwood, The Art of Living with the End in Mind by a woman I know named Barbara Becker. So welcome, Barbara. Hi. Hi, Nina. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Now, normally I have a copy of the book with me and I don't have one, so I'm going to ask you to hold it up because it's beautiful. So there it is, Heartwood, The Art of Living with the End in Mind by Barbara Becker. It's coming out officially in May, but you can pre-order it now. Thank you, Barbara. And um, it's a book about death. It's a book about um, living with awareness of death. And I came to the book because, as many of you know, I did a master's almost 10 years ago now in the subject of narrative medicine at Columbia, which is kind of the study of how we tell our stories of death and dying and illness. And in the course, when I was doing that program, I ended up getting a life coach certificate. And I also briefly did a program at this Zen Institute in New York on 23rd Street called the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. And that's where I met Barbara. She was doing the same program. Um, I ended up actually leaving the program. I did some volunteer work at Lenox Hill. And at the time I was working at Maimonides in hospice care, a big hospital in Brooklyn, um, working with the palliative care department. But in any case, we met because our interests converged and I really liked Barbara. I had no idea who she was or what she was planning on doing, um, but we've kind of stayed in touch on Facebook. And I guess sometime in the last year, it I became aware that she had written this book that was coming out. I asked to see it, I read it. And I absolutely loved it. And I have a real interest in death books in general. I really believe in this idea of um, being aware of death and talking about it and kind of changing the way we talk about death. So it's very much a book up my alley. And, and of course I come from book publishing. So all things converge and I just really wanna celebrate you. So welcome. Um, I think my first question, Barbara, we were starting to talk about it before we went live is I'd love to hear like your journey. You're how old? I am 54. I just turned 54. Right, and I'm 51. So you're very much in our demo at the Wolfer. Um, and this is your first book. So what led you to this point? If you can kind of give us a little bit of your story. Sure. So I was one of those weird little kids who thought about big existential questions kind of early in life. And I, I was led to that because I sort of discovered accidentally one day that my father had been married before he married my mother and that his first wife had died in a tragic boating accident. Now, it was shortly after their honeymoon. Um, she was pregnant at the time. And um, the story of Maureen, which was her name, just came to permeate our lives, my brothers and my lives. Um, we almost felt like we had a ghost living in our house. I mean, my, my father had their love letters still. He had them at the bottom of his closet in a shoebox. And I'm telling you, Nina, every time my parents went out, I would get a flashlight and I would sit on the floor of their closet and just read through these gorgeous, like just heartbreakingly beautiful letters. Wow, so, how did your mom, how did your mom feel about the Maureen story? Oh, uh, what a good question. I mean, I, I really think my mom should have been sainted and she was so extraordinary about this because she just loved my father so much. So much so that she would pay every year for the cemetery in Connecticut where Maureen was buried to lay a wreath on oh, wow. Christmas time. So that was my mom. Wow, how much, uh, how many years passed between Maureen's death and when your dad married your mom? Um, I think that was six years. Wow, okay, yeah. wow. So he'd had this horrible loss that was kind of kept secret from you? Were you told one day or you discovered it? I discovered it and I discovered it because I was snooping in my father's wallet one day when I was in third grade and I was looking at a picture of my mom in his old leather wallet and I saw the fringes of another photograph behind hers mm -hmm. and I kind of pried it out and there was this beautiful 
timeless woman. And um, my mom caught me and I asked who she was. Um, and she, she gave me the story and my father gave me the story in little kind of age appropriate pieces. Like I didn't know the full thing until I was probably in high school. So the story of this death kind of guided you growing up and was always super important to you. Super That's interesting. That's right. Yeah. And my parents were both medical professionals. My dad was a neurosurgeon and we would have the craziest conversations at the dinner table in our house, you know, of blood, gore, death, dying, you know, it just, it felt almost normal to me, even mm -hmm. though I later went on to volunteer as a candy striper in the local hospital. And I was a disaster at that, like blood and gore literally made me faint. So I knew that wasn't my path. <laughs> but is that still the case? Because of course you've worked as a hospice volunteer. So to take us from childhood to now, I mean, did you always work in this field? I know you're an interfaith minister, but I, my understanding is that happened later. So how did your career end up taking you to where you are now? Yeah, so good question. I, I took a totally different path or so I thought. And I ended up working in international human rights for mm -hmm. elevating the story of human right, rights activists around the world. Um, but it always kind of came back to this idea of impermanence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I worked a lot with a group called the Argentine Forensic Anthropology Group mm -hmm. that would excavate mass graves to tell the stories of atrocities and, um, you know, um. bring the law and science to bear on these huge human rights issues. So it kind of kept creeping back a little bit towards death and towards the way that people are um, tortured in mm -hmm. prison, like really suffer for their work. So they felt kind of related to me. Yeah, it doesn't seem unrelated, yeah. yeah. So you worked in human rights and then you became interested in becoming a minister? Yeah, but first along the way, I, I had that stopping point, which was really a beginning point at the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. And that was a nine month training program, as you said, and I was placed at Bellevue Hospital in New York City, which is our big public hospital. And every week I would meet patients at the very end of their lives. That was like very critical end of life care at Bellevue. And I accompanied hundreds and hundreds of people at the end of their lives, you know, under the mentorship of these two beautiful Zen monks. Yeah, I have to say, we should, we should pause to say the men who run the Zen Center for Compl Contemplative Care are extraordinary. Um, Chodo and... Koshin. Koshin, really just extraordinary men. I had them come to my Maimonides a number of times to talk to the medical residents. Um, they're really very special. So yeah, okay, so you, you worked with them. I worked with them. And in the course of being at a public hospital like Bellevue, you start to see how people's religious and spiritual or philosophically secular beliefs help them, guide them. And mm -hmm. at a moment of crisis. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I really, I mean, I was the last person in the world I thought would become a minister, an ordained minister. But the fact that I, I learned of another exciting place called One Spirit Interfaith Seminary that trains people to work with um, people of many different faith traditions the world over, um, I, I saw that as an opportunity to really be able to be present with people in the way that made sense to them. Yeah, did you grow up a particular religion? And how do you feel about Buddhism in particular? Oh, Buddhism, like the closest thing to my heart. I grew up in the Protestant traditions, like kind of across the board, depending on where we lived when I was growing up, we were Presbyterian or Methodist or Reformed yeah. Church of America. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to a college, Haverford College, that had its roots in Quakerism. And that was the first time I experienced a religious tradition based in silence. Mm -hmm. I mean, Quaker meetings are entirely silent until somebody feels moved to kind of stand up and speak their truth. But um, I was overcome by giggles the first time I was 
was in a Quaker meeting because I just couldn't believe nobody was talking. It was so foreign to me. Um, but I think that really, that's that idea of the inner light within and Quaker yeah. kind of led me to Buddhism. Yeah, well, there's a relationship, right? The medita meditative, meditative quality. Um, I've never been to actually to a Quaker service, um, but I've always been intrigued by them. I should oh, do Oh, I that. highly recommend it. I yeah, mean, I like I the idea of the silence. Yeah. And now, do you consider yourself a Buddhist or do you really consider yourself, I don't know, pan-religious? Yeah, well, I would say that Buddhism is my root tradition. I have now been at it for 21 years, and I'm sort of ecumenically Buddhist as well. I like the Zen tradition is beautiful to me, but also the Vipassana Southeast Asian tradition and Tibetan and I've learned a lot from bond teachers, which is the indigenous related to Buddhism tradition of um, Tibet. Wow. So, you should write another book on religion. It's super interesting actually to think about all these different practices. It really um, is. I mean, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the concept? I was very moved in the book um, by the concept of Heartwood, the title of the book. It really is a great metaphor and it carries itself all the way through and I think really stays with the reader. So tell us how you came to that and what does it mean for you? Sure. I, I was so happy to stumble upon this metaphor found in nature because uh, who, who isn't influenced by nature? Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what tradition you come from or what you believe in or don't believe in. Um, and heartwood is the inner core of trees. And it's the part that's super strong, as strong as steel in many ways. And it's most prized by woodworkers. But what people don't know about heartwood is that it's completely inert. I mean, it's dead. It doesn't participate anymore in the flow of nutrients and water in a tree. <laughs> but the growth rings around the heartwood wouldn't grow if they didn't have the strength of that pillar within. Mm -hmm. So heartwood like, enabled me to tell these two stories at the same time, the stories of loss, but also of love and sort of the essence of what remains and what keeps going on. It's really gorgeous. So that's kind of the, the idea basically is that your grief is not something to be fixed. It's something that is at, is at our core really, right? And that we, we love around it. And each chapter of the book, um, I was also really impressed with the way you structured it as someone who writes herself like it was not it's not easy to figure out how to do a memoir where you're also talking about an idea. And um, the way Barbara structures it is each chapter is about a story in your life so it's about um, your father's first wife or it's about it, the, the first chapter is about one of your dearest oldest friends who dies and you kind of frame it as this starts your journey. Um, but or or many chapters are about people you work with in hospice right so each chapter is about a story of loss. Um, and then kind of, you know, we you weave in memoir and throughout you weave in this idea of living with loss as a way to live as a way to thrive ultimately or as a way to. I don't know, how would you describe it as a way to live more fully, live more fully. Thank you. Yeah, it's really great. It's really great. And what do you think? Um, what's your hope for the book? I mean, I'm someone who just likes books about I mean, I did the narrative medicine program in large part, I'm, I think, you know, because my mom died when I was young, and I had always been, you know, that grief had been really a defining aspect of my life for so many years and I wanted to understand better kind of her choices why she kept her illness a secret I wanted to understand my own inability to kind of get over her death and um and I think through doing that program and through meeting the monks and you know all, all the work I did in that area I really did come to feel much more comfortable with the idea of impermanence and change. So these Buddhist concepts um, and loss. And I do feel like greatly now at 51 kind of, I don't know if healed is the right word, but more, much more comfortable with all of these ideas. So I'm curious, so I really believe in it. I believe that kind of writing and sharing these stories um, and sinking into these ideas is um, therapeutic in and of itself. So who are you hoping will read this book? What are you hoping will happen with this book? 
Well, um, as you so well know, like we live in a death shy world. Yeah. And we just don't talk about death. And yet the more I would tell people about what I was doing, I noticed how hungry people are for these conversations, how they, you know, if I told a story about somebody I lost, it would beget one of their stories and right. then another story. So we are just starved, um, like just really wanting to honor the people we've lost or to, or to tell something that was really hard about the grief sure. journey. So I hope that Heartwood inspires people to tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. And when you tell your own stories, people realize they're not alone. Um, yep. Because this grief journey can feel so lonely, like we're the only one it's happening to. And and it's just not the case. Yeah, which so, is so much the idea, sorry to interrupt you, but of the Wolfer community in general, right? The idea here is really share your story so that you don't feel alone, so that you know you're not alone, because everyone is on the same path. So I completely agree with you that your book can kind of enlarge, expand um, that sense of understanding life and death and will be comforting to people. Yeah, I hope so. And it's such interesting timing, right? Because we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel of the COVID pandemic. I mean, we're, we're so close. And um, before we kind of launch from this period of time, like straight into the equivalent of the roaring 20s that followed the 1918 pandemic, um, can we stop and pause and really take lessons from what we've learned from this really, really difficult time? Um, yeah. One of the stories I tell in, in Hartwood is about being called to the potter's field in New York City, where people were being buried whose bodies weren't claimed by loved ones. And um, I had the opportunity to do a few memorial services there. And um, we really do have to take a look at this. I mean, death is the great equalizer, yeah. but not everybody dies equally. You know, one, one reverend I know lost 44 members of his congregation because mm -hmm. they were essential workers and people who just did not have access to the same protective measures. So, um, you know, if, if you stick around this world of death and grief long enough, you see, you begin to see the injustice. The inequity, yeah. Yes. That's a whole other subject and super sad and super, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what kind of work do you do like on a daily basis? Like what is your life like as a minister? So um, I have been privileged to do funerals, memorials, celebrations of people's lives and also weddings. I mean, nice. how great to mix the, the great joys of life and the great sorrows. Mm -hmm. um, you really see paradox when you work in this world. It's like the Taoists say, this is the world of 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. Beautiful. And can we live in it all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. How is it affected? You have children, right? You have two sons. I, I do. I have a 17 year old and a 21 year old. And, and how, do you, how do they think about your work and this book? And have they read it yet? They, uh, I just sent it to my son in Boston, who promises me he's going to read it as soon as he gets it. Um, he should because he's in it. Yeah. <laughs> And um, my younger son, and they are, um, I think they're super compassionate people. And we gave them opportunities to, to be around death themselves. So when my mom was dying, um, they, were, they were younger, they were at home, and we gave them the chance to come out to New Jersey and to be with her when she was on hospice. And they thought about it and we kind of coached them through it and they came and they were with her when she died. Beautiful. And I think this is the thing we're so far away from in our culture. Like we don't get to see that. We kind yeah. of shelter people from that. Yeah. And they, they saw the whole thing in all of its difficulty, but in also the ways that we sang to her and 
you know, and held her hands and rubbed lotion into her feet. And, and they know, they, they, yeah. they know something that a lot of people, even much older, don't. Yeah, don't know. That's really great. No, I often think we lose sight of the fact that, you know, there is so much celebration around birth and it is very similar, right? It's, it's this huge passing into another place that we don't know. I mean, you're coming into the world, you're leaving the world. And there are, I mean, I wish for everyone a, a thoughtful death, you know, a beautiful, beautiful death. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to glorify it, but a, a, a thoughtful death, an aware death. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing I think that might be nice for for your listeners to think about is that I, I sort of accidentally did this, but I started referring to death as a woman. Mm. And, you know, we have this way of making death this creepy figure with the big black cloak and the bony finger and the scythe. And um, it's, it's horrifying, yeah. but I guess because of Maureen, this early, our early loss in our family, I started thinking of death. I just naturally did as a, as a woman, maybe as a mother or a friend, yeah. like somebody who we could learn from. Sit at the table. Yeah. yeah, that's a beautiful concept. I love that. Now I've already, now it's your third book. <laughs> um, it is great because of course, so many people, I mean, in my own world, I, I, people are just afraid. They just don't want to talk about death. And I often find it kind of confusing because it's going to happen to all of us. So we might as well, you know. We might as well jump in, learn what we can, and make the most of these beautiful, beautiful, precious lives that we yeah, have. Yeah, really beautiful. Thank you, Barbara, so much. It's lovely to see you. You also have gorgeous cheekbones. I'm glad to see your face <laughs> again. Oh, and I remembered we have that other funny <laughs> connection. Are you related to Shelly, my beloved accountant? I and am. Oh, that's wonderful. I have yes. an accountant who has been in my life, Shelly Jacobson, since I was, I think, 19. And I always joke, like, she's really, I think, the only professional in my life who I, I consider her kind of sacred. Like, <laughs> like she, she cannot die before I do. She just simply cannot. Um, and I remember discovering on Facebook that we have her in common. So that's nice, too. She is terrific. She really is. Yeah, she's a great person. All right. Really great to see you. Good luck with your book. We'll be doing everything we can to promote it. Everyone, let's see it one more time for people who just are signing in. It's called Heartwood, The Art of Living with the End in Mind by Barbara Becker. It's a wonderful book. It's coming out in May. And um, it's a great gift, I think, for people who are, well, for all sorts of people, but for people who are interested in, in life, spirituality, death, etc. All right, Barbara, take yeah. care. Good to see you. Take care. Bye. Bye.